For some, it's just an event that they attend, an experience they seek out once or twice a month. For others, it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a social club, a place for them to connect and, and, and drink coffee with, with like-minded people, people who look the same, think the same, believe the same, laugh at all the same jokes. And for others, it's just a building in the neighborhood. It's a place where people go to be married and buried and to sing songs about some guy named Jesus. When I say the word church, what is it to you? What comes to mind for you? What immediately do you think of? When I say the word church, what, what feeling or sensation washes over you? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Or is it nothing? The reason I ask is because today we're continuing a teaching series that we started last week called Friendship 101, where we are looking at how the friendship that Jesus has with us as his followers transforms the relationship that we have with others. We, we started last week by talking about how Jesus is the best of friends to each and every one of us, and he, he loves us as a friend in a particular way, and he, and he uses that word. He's the one who calls us his friends. But then what we're looking at now in the rest of the series is how Jesus invites us to befriend other people the way he has befriended us. Specifically, we're going to look at how Jesus calls us to befriend our enemies, how Jesus calls us to befriend the stranger, and today, how Jesus calls us to befriend the church. How Jesus calls us to befriend the church, or you could say other Christian people. Now, before I dive into what we're going to talk about today, I just want to recognize something. Last week, uh, we, we used that phrase, Jesus is our friend, over and over and over again. And some of you made a point to remind me of, of a viral video that went around a handful of years ago by the same name. It goes by, Jesus is my friend. And uh, I went back and watched the video again, and it has been stuck in my brain for the last week. And I thought, you know what? Uh, I need everyone to be to be carrying this burden with me. Since we are a family of faith, I'm not the only person who can have this stuck in my heart and mind and ingrained in my soul forever. So I'm going to share it with the rest of you who might not be familiar with it. This is Jesus is my friend. Take a look. Jesus is a friend of mine. That's right. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of it gets better. He taught me how to live my life as it should be. He taught me how to turn my cheek when people laugh at me. I've had friends before, and I can tell you that he's one who will never leave you flat. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Yeah. Jesus is a friend That's enough. A we can cut it. Jesus. Jesus yeah. Is a friend of mine. Uh, so first of all, you're welcome. <laughs> that is going to be with you till the day that you die. <laughs> my favorite part, aside from the clothing, my favorite part is the guy playing his guitar strung way down low like this, way before it was cool. Ah, man, that is going to be in your head all day. <laughs> Jesus is indeed our friend. But Jesus has called us to be friends with the church. And that is what we're going to talk about today how Jesus calls us to be friends with the church. Now, according to the scriptures, the church is a lot of things. The church is the body of Christ. The church is often called the bride of Christ. The church is the people of God, among whom and through whom God is living and active and working. And, and all of that is true. But for the sake of our conversation today, I want to offer you a different definition of the church. The church is a community of people, a gathering of people bound together by the love of Jesus, bound together by and for the love of Jesus. Now that de definition comes from two words that are incredibly common in the New Testament to describe the church. Those two Greek words are ekklesia and koinonia. Often when you hear the church referred to in the scriptures, it uses one or both of these words. Ecclesia means being called out from wherever you are into a new place, into a new gathering, into a new community. And, and koinonia means, well, it's often translated as fellowship, but that word kind of gets lost on church people. What, what koinonia means is, 
is, is a deep connection and bond and a deep enjoyment and sharing of life with one another. And so you take those two concepts together, ecclesia, being called out and gathered together as a new community, and, and deeply bonding, deeply sharing and connecting over something significant. That's where you get this definition of a community called together by and for the love of Jesus. That's who we are. And in the first century, when the church was first starting, this community of friends, this community of friends connected by and for the work of Jesus, this community of friends could not help but get together. There, there was a sense that they, they had to be together, that what they had experienced in Jesus bound them together as friends in a deep way so that they had to form a new community and enjoy the benefits of being in this community. They couldn't not meet and enjoy this life together. And that's the big idea today, that, that the same is true for you and me today as members of the church. It wasn't just a first century thing that people said, we've got to be together as a community of friends. It's true today. In fact, I would go so far as to say that, that Jesus saved you in part for this purpose, to be a part of this community of friends and to enjoy the gift and the blessing that comes with it. Now, let, let's look at what it was about that first century church, about that early church, that made it so irresistible to those first followers of Jesus. And this is where Acts chapter 2 that we just read comes in really handy because it gives us a description and really a prescription of what life as a, as a community of friends bound by, by Jesus and for Jesus should look like. And so the first thing we see is that these people had to be together. They just had to be together because they shared a life-changing experience. And they wanted to reorient their lives around that shared experience. Look again at what Luke says, starting in verse 42. He says, they devoted themselves, they reoriented their lives around the apostle, apostles' teaching and the fellowship being together to the breaking of bread, which refers both to, in all likelihood, the Lord's Supper, but then also enjoying everyday meals together and the prayers. You and me, him and her, we all come from different places. We have different stories. We, we are different people, uh, profoundly different in some scenarios. We like different things. We, we live different ways. We, we, we vote different ways, maybe. I don't know. And yet, there is this thing that binds us together, this diverse community of people. And what binds us together at a deep level is the fact that my life has been changed by Jesus that I have been brought from death to life by the work of Jesus. And so have you. And so have you. In, in the earliest moments of the church, you had a few thousand people who heard the message of Christ crucified for you to forgive you and then risen out of your grave to free you from sin, death, the devil, and all that's bad and broken in this world. And they were then baptized into God's family. And in a moment, in an instant, their whole lives were different. You had all these people who had, from what we can tell, no otherworldly connection, and now all of a sudden they'd all had this transformative experience, and they said, I, I don't know you and you don't know me, but we, we have to be together because we've all had our lives changed by Jesus. And, and we need to know what it means to reorient our whole existence and, and relearn the whole world in light of who he is and what he's done and what he's promised. They, they, they had to be together because they shared this foundational, life-changing experience. And friends, that is true today still. You and I, you and me, we, we share this experience. And it is meant to bind us together at a deep level, to, to, be, to be bigger and, 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 and deeper than all the other things that tend to bind us together. There's lots of stuff that we can connect over. We can connect over politics. People love to do that. We can connect over pop culture. What terrible reality show do you like that I also like? We can connect over our, our 
our ethnicity, our, our racial background. We can, we can connect over uh, our, our economic status. Maybe we're at the same level. People love to do that. We can connect over our shared education. But there's lots of things that people connect over and create little tribes around, lots of things. But, but this life-changing encounter that you've had with Jesus and that I've had with Jesus is meant to be the thing above and beneath and around all other things that bind us together. So that you say and I say, well... Yeah, it's an eclectic group for sure, but we got to be together because we both have been transformed by grace. And because of that, that early church and this church, they simply had to be together. You're the only person that gets it like I get it. You're the only person that's experienced it like I've experienced it. You're the only person that's trying to relearn human existence in light of this truth like I'm trying to relearn it. We have to be together. We have to. But there's more. Look at verse 43. Verse 43, Luke says this. He says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Uh, scriptures tell us that among these early followers of Jesus, these, these early Christians in the earliest days of the church, when they would gather together, the presence of God would manifest itself among them in palpable and powerful ways. That signs and wonders, Luke says, were being done by the apostles in their midst. That every time the church gathered something incredible, seemingly supernatural, took place. And so you had among the early Christians this sense that, that they had to be a part of this community of friends because when this community of friends got together, incredible things happened. And, and, and I would argue to you that that is still true today. Whenever God's people get together, when this community of friends bound together by and for the love of Jesus shares space in his name, God promises to show up in incredible ways. It's not quite the same as the first century. God was doing a unique thing in the earliest days of the church, but he's, he's still here and alive and active. But I would, I would offer to you that, that perhaps, perhaps we struggle to have the right heart to hunger for it and the right eyes to see it. Amen. One of the side effects of sin is that it numbs our senses to the divine and the miraculous and the holy. And so it's easy for us to take these things for granted or overlook them altogether. Which reminds me of a famous quote from, from the writer Ralph Waldo Emerson. He once said this. He said, If the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore? and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God which had been shown. Emerson says, the stars in the sky, if they only showed themselves once every thousand years, all of humanity would stop and stare with their, with their jaws dropped and their hearts open in awe of God. And then those who saw it would tell subsequent generations that they were there on the night when this gift of the stars made themselves known. They would celebrate it and talk about it for generations, this miracle that is the night sky. And Emerson says this because, of course, the stars come out every night. The stars come out every night, and we're numb to it. And so despite the fact that it's a miracle in the sky, the stars come out every night, and rather than look up and give God praise and say, you are a miracle worker, we put our heads down and we scroll our phones. Did you know that when the people of God gather, God is still doing incredible things? That every week when we gather, somebody walks into this place burdened and broken by the difficulties of this life, wondering if they've got the strength in them to take one more step. And then they walk out of this place feeling more hopeful, feeling, feeling a little bit more peace, feeling like they have the strength to keep going. That, my friends, is a miracle. You might overlook it, but it's a miracle. Every week when we gather, there's somebody who walks into this place so filled with shame that they want to crawl underneath the pew and die. And then they hear 
that despite their sin and their struggles and their mistakes, that they are a beloved child of God and they are brought to life. Friends, that is a miracle. When we gather, each and every time we gather, God gives us his gifts. On a regular basis, we celebrate the gift of baptism, and though it looks mundane to human eyes, what we're told in the scriptures is that every time someone is baptized, they're being brought from death to life. They're going from being not in the kingdom to in the kingdom. And that every time we gather at this table, we don't just eat bread and wine as, so it's, as though it's some devotional snack. What we consume is the promises and the person of Jesus. What we consume is forgiveness. Friends, that is a miracle. Every time we gather, people come into this place and they offer up prayers. Prayers for marriages to be fixed, for kids to come to faith, for a job to be found, for their bodies to be healed. And every time we offer up these prayers, gathered as God's people, in Jesus' name, the God of the universe stops and he listens and he hears and he answers. My friends, that is a miracle. And because that happens when God's people gather, the early church and the present church says to themselves, well, I I have to be here. I have to be part of this community of friends. I have to be here because incredible things happen here. But there's even more. What drew the church together in the beginning and and draws us together still today was a profound sense of interdependence and with it a deep sense of purpose. Look again at the description of how they shared their lives. Luke says this, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They shared everything. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. People came to the church to be a part of the church. They couldn't resist the church because they said to themselves, I have needs that can be met by the church and I am needed to meet the needs of others within this church. I have to be here because I am needed and I am necessary. The church began among the very, very poor in a time in human history where there was no social safety net for the poor at all. And so as the church formed and gathered and people brought their their normal human needs to the table, the church didn't look at each other and say, well, tough, hope you figure it out. They said, well, this is what we're here for. We are each other's keeper. We are each other's safety net. We are each other's security. There was this belief that, that God was at work for the church through the church. And and people brought what they had to make it all possible for them to to form and sustain as a community and to to bless each other and share with each other. And and there was this deep sense that my presence was essential in order to not only have my needs met, but to help meet the needs of my neighbor, that God was at work through us, for us. And that gave to these early believers a deep sense of purpose and belonging. Look, everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Everybody. And everybody wants to be a part of a community where they know that their presence is essential. And the church provided that. Did you know that your presence is essential here? Did you know that the church is still doing what is described in Acts chapter 2? That we are still pooling our resources to make all of this possible. That, That everything that happens in this community of friends bound together by and for Jesus, that everything that happens here is because the people here have said, all right, well, here, here's the gift I have, here's the resource I have, here's the talent that I have, and we all, we all push it to the center of the table and we share and we give so that, so that all of this can be possible and that so many needs can be met. That there is somebody in this church right now, I guarantee it, who, who is a part of this church, who's, a, who's a, one of the friends in the faith, and, and they are they are praying that they can find a way to pay a bill this week. And there's somebody else in this church who knows their name but doesn't know them well enough to know their need who has more than enough. 
and who can be the answer to that prayer. And there is somebody in this church who needs a word of encouragement because they are, they are, they are dying on the vine with all the pressures of life. And there's somebody else in this church who notices them and sees all their gifts and sees just how much of a blessing they are and believes big things for them but doesn't know them well enough yet or isn't bold enough yet to actually tell them that. But that person is dying to hear what this other person knows and be aware of what this other person sees in them. There are people here whose bodies are breaking down, whose bank accounts are empty, whose needs are high, and there are other people here who, who have the ability to notice those needs, respond to those needs, and, and also pray for and lift people up in those needs. That, my friends, is what we are here for. And yet, and yet, we will not experience the richness of that if those of us who are here don't lean in enough, engage deep enough to know names and know needs and to be bold enough to say, I can help meet that need, I can give this, I can share this, I'll make sure the church has the ability to do this or that, I'll make sure that the person who sits down the pew for me doesn't go without, I'll make sure of that. But it takes all of us saying, I'm gonna be engaged here, I'm not just going to attend, but I'm going to befriend here. Your presence is needed. It is essential. And in the early church, people said, I have to be here because I'm needed and because I have needs. And this is where God is at work for us and through us. I got, an I got another one. There's, the, people had to be a part of the early church because the early church was a source of tremendous joy. It was a source of joy. In a world of persecution, pain, and chaos, and anxiety, the community of friends bound together by and for Jesus was a source of joy. Look at how Luke describes their, their interaction. He says, day by day, not just one day a week, day by day, they found a way to be together. They were attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. Come over to my place and eat. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were laughing. They were crying. They were talking, praising God and having favor with all the people. They were giving God praise. They were offering prayers, and their neighbors were looking at them going, man, those folks are having a good time. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Look at that description, glad hearts, generous hearts, grateful hearts, worshipful hearts. That is a wonderful description of a group of people. Being part of the community of friends filled them with joy. One of the ways in which you can tell whether or not a relationship that you have is, is healthy or not is the hangover that the relationship leads, leaves you with. And every relationship leaves a hangover, an after effect, either a good one or a bad one. When you're done hanging out with a person or a group of people, do you feel uplifted? Do you feel, do you feel grateful for that relationship? Do you feel a little lighter? Do you feel more loved? That's good. That's probably a healthy relationship. Or when you leave that person or when you walk away from that, that group of people, do you find that the room is spinning and you ask yourself, why do I do this to myself over and over again? That's probably an unhealthy relationship. The church, the church is meant to leave you with a lingering joy. Amen. When we gather together, the goal is for you, when we're done gathering, be it here or around the scriptures in a Bible study or at one another's homes or over a glass of wine and some good food down the street, when, when the church gathers together, the, the end result is meant to be a lingering joy, glad and grateful hearts giving praise to God. And that's our goal here on a Sunday morning. If, if after worshiping at St. Mark, you log off the live stream or you, you head to your car and you're thinking to yourself, why do I do this to myself? Oh, this is the worst. Then we're doing something wrong. Our goal is for you to walk out with a little more goodness and joy than you walked in with. Because that's what, that's what the community of faith is supposed to be about. And at the heart of that joy is Jesus the kind of community he creates where among us, even though there's, there's so much diversity and difference among us, we are bound together by this truth that we are loved and saved by grace alone through him, and then that makes us a very gracious community with one another. So that no matter what you walk in with or what I, what I struggle with, 
We will speak truth to one another. We will hold each other accountable, but ultimately, we will extend mercy and grace and forgiveness to each other. So you can come into this place. You can be utterly real. You can be vulnerable. At least that's the way it should be. And know that you will be seen, held, loved, challenged, but ultimately absolved in Jesus' name. And that is meant to fill you with joy. And then that joy that you walk out with, knowing you are loved and forgiven, becomes the greatest apologetic to an unbelieving world. Your greatest evangelism tool to your family and your friends is your joy. Because the world cannot resist a community of friends who are filled with joy. Because I don't know if you've noticed, every other community that we're a part of fills us with angst and anger plays on our fears, nurtures our divisions. We leave those groups, so many of those groups, so many of those connections, we leave so many of those interactions worse for wear. And so when the world sees somebody who walks out of church and they got a fresh perspective because they know every sin is forgiven and their future is secure and Jesus is king who's conquered all the crap that divides us, right? Right? When they see someone who walks out of church and they're a little lighter in their footsteps and a little more joyful and peace-filled, they look at that and go, who prescribed what to this guy? And how do I get some of that? When they see a community of people who are filled with peace and have perspective, who are utterly engaged in what's going on by the world, but who are not overtaken by it because they know that Jesus is the king of the world and Jesus the king loves them, the, the, and they have a joy because of that. The rest of the world goes, what? What is that? And that's why Luke says, the Lord added to their number each and every day. And they had favor with all the people because the rest of the world said, man, they got something I want. They have joy. And this is meant to stir a little bit of joy. So now, if all of that's true, that that the church is a community of friends who can't resist being together because they're bound together by something that's that's deep and foundational, this life-changing experience, because every time they get together, God shows up in a miraculous way, and because they have a profound sense of purpose, meeting each other's needs and making this mission possible, and because they, they leave this place and enjoy in this place peace and joy and perspective, if all of that's true, then, then there are two questions for you, okay? Two questions that I want you to wrestle with for the rest of the day while you're humming, Jesus is my friend, wrestle with this. <laughs> am, am I enjoying this gift of the church? Or am I just going to church? And am I sharing this gift of the church? Or am I hoarding this gift of the church? There are people in your life who need to know what is possible as part of the church. Do do they know that they're welcome here, that they are wanted here? Likewise, are are, are you making the most of the opportunity that, that you've been given to enjoy this gift of the church? Let me just lovingly, with, with, without any judgment, honestly, just, just challenge you, like, like maybe, maybe try to come and receive God's gifts and be with God's people more than once every four to six weeks. Or, or be a part of a class or one of the many communities that meets where we gather around God's word and you get to, you get to know other people and experience the gift that is the church or or, or you take a fresh assessment of, of, your, of your resources and you go, how, how can I bring what I have to the center of the table so that, so that needs can be met, the mission can grow? How can I do that? Maybe that's what you wrestle with over lunch today. How can we more, more deeply engage with and enjoy the gift that is the church? Start here. Like, learn a name and go to lunch. Learn someone's name and invite them to lunch. That's how it starts, the enjoyment of the gift of the church. I'll close the same way I began. For some, the church is, church is an experience that you seek out a couple times a month, at best. For others, it is a social club, a place to gather with like-minded people and 
drink some coffee. For others, it's just a building, a place where people go to get married and buried. Whatever the church has been up until this moment for you, I I remind you that, that Jesus wants it to be so much more for you. Christians all agree that Jesus has saved us from some terrible things. That's what makes him such an incredible friend. He saved us from the punishment that sin deserves, from alienation with God our Father. He he saved us from the terrors of death and all that's dark and difficult in this world. He saved us from those things. That's what makes him such a great friend. But let us not forget, he has also saved us for some incredible things. And one of the things he has saved us for is this gift of being friends around him and through him and for him. God has brought you into a community where you can be bound together by the deepest of things. He has brought you into a community where he promises to be living and active and to show up every time we gather. He has brought you into a community where you are needed, where your gifts are necessary. He's brought you into a community. He's brought you into a community where there can be great peace and measurable joy. May we not only go to church, may we be the church and befriend the church. I have to be here. Amen.